Hey, well, good morning, good morning. My name is Trent. I'm one of the pastors here at Northfield. Whether you're here in the house, you're watching from your house, or maybe you're catching us from I-65 headed your way to the beach, I'm thankful that you made us a part of your spring break week. That's exciting, exciting, exciting. If you're a student, I'm thankful for you that you get a spring break. If you're an educator, I'm really thankful that you get a break. That just I hope I hope that for both of you that, that this little week gives you enough strength and energy to get, get, get over the hump through the rest of this school year. If you're one of those people that you're like, I haven't had a spring break in like 5, 10, 20, 40 years, well, you know, I'm, I hope you have a great week. I'm thankful that you're here and just enjoy living through everybody else's spring break. If you're a parent who has a kid that's at home on spring break while you're at work, I just, I'm so sorry about your food budget this week. Like, you're just going you're going you're going gonna to lose i'm sorry that's just how how it is going to be but no matter what no matter how you're spending your spring break i'm thankful that you kicked it off with us here we're going to do a little two week detour from our upside down kingdom series and do a little series that we're calling are we there yet and chances are chances are you have either asked or more likely you have been asked this question before i've done a, a quite a few youth trips having to be the driver of those and this question always comes are we there there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? My answer every time is we're about an hour. We could be eight hours away. We could be 15 minutes away. I'm like, it'd be about an hour, about an hour. Cause that's just usually like a, okay, well I'll ask you again in an hour and I can live with that. But, but in that, what I have found is now that I have children, I've realized that the frequency of this question seems to increase as their age decreases. Has anybody experienced this before? Just this question of, of, of are we there yet? And the first ask of, are we there yet? Is like, I get it. Okay. Like every drive that you you ever do is like 30 minutes max, right? That makes sense. But then past that, like there, there seems to be a, a tone and a feeling of, of desperation and desolation and I'm never going to get out of this car and, and like, and you feel that. And the more that that happens, the more as a parent that you go, I'm never going to get out of this car. Like I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to be here forever with a screaming child in the back seat of the car. And, and let me, let me ask, how many of you ever had this moment in? Okay. Usually it happens about an hour into your trip. Okay. The, the, here's the checklist. Okay. All the snacks are gone. Okay. Yep. Every toy has been played with the iPads at 20%, even though you charged it last night. Okay. And there's only the only hope that you have is the Bucky's trip that you have planned on the way. But you get this false hope like every quarter mile because you see the billboard that you're like, we're getting closer. And it's like, nope, you're still 200 miles away. But we're telling you it's coming, right? Has anybody ever been there? Anybody been there? Can, and also, can we talk about, can we talk about Bucky's for a second? Like, some of y'all, some of y'all are, you're early adopters. Like you, you weren't from here, you're from out of town. And so Bucky's is not a new thing to you, but now it's turned into like this phenomenon. Like, and, and so I'm in that kind of next group that the, the mass introduction of Bucky's. I love Bucky's. My friends and I, we call it Bucky's behavior. And here's what I mean by Bucky's behavior. Cause if you ever, if you ever had a middle schooler or you remember being that middle schooler, that first time that you're away from home, okay. Mom and dad gives you a little bit of money. And it says, Hey, this is enough money to last you for the entire week. Okay, this should, this should be all your meals, everything that you would need. And then that first gas station trip, it's just like, I bought everything, everything. And you're just like, got here. And it's just like, how are you going to pay for food the rest of the week? It's like, don't care, don't care, right? That's what Bucky's will do to the most mature individuals I've ever met in my life. Okay, because I, I just, there's nowhere else on the planet that you can go and you can use the nicest restroom you've ever used, right? You can eat an entire smoked sausage wrapped in a tortilla on a stick that you can eat 20 to 30 different types of beef jerky. You can have about 17 different kinds of candy and you can get your normal gas station snacks and fill up the gas tank. I'm telling you, there is nothing like Bucky's. And some of y'all that are just like, you know what? No, I don't need it. If, if enough people tell you, you should do something, you should do something, you get even more resistant, more resistant. Like you need to have a Ronald Reagan moment where you need to tear down that wall, okay? Let me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you, there is nothing like a little Bucky's behavior on a road trip. And so if you're at Bucky's right now, I mean, statistically, somebody's watching from Bucky's because there's like 100,000 people at every Bucky's location 
24 hours a day that, that somebody's probably watching. So from Bucky's, bring me some beaver nuggets and that'll be good. All right, um, we could, I could go all day talking about Bucky's. I'm telling you, I love it. But, but in this, it, it, since we're talking about, uh, talking about traveling, can I, can I tell you a little truth about traveling? And you know this, you know this already. But, but here, here's a, just a, a little bit of truth. But the road you're on will get you to your destination. That's deep, right? The road that you are on will get you to your destination. And this is true whether you're talking about a walking path or you're talking about interstates, train tracks, it doesn't matter. That there is a path that you are on, it will ultimately lead you to your destination. And there's a principle that we're gonna look at today and next week over the, over the course of these two weeks that, that's called the principle of the path. And this is not new, this is not groundbreaking material. I think it was really popularized and made famous by Andy Stanley. But from that, he, he stole this from scripture. He stole this wisdom straight from God. And so in that, as we kind of talk through this, it's found in the book of Proverbs and we'll get there in just a moment. But the principle of the path is this, that it is your direction not your intention that determines your destination. It is your direction, not your intention, that determines your destination. Here, here's my, my case in point, okay? If you were to have packed the suitcases, you got all the swim trunks out, you got all your shorts, you got your beach bag ready, you got everything that you need for a successful beach trip, you lined up all the restaurants that you have not eaten at that you can't wait to get to. If you've lined it up, you get in the car, you say, God, would you please grant our little family traveling mercies as we make our way to Florida? And then you get to I-65 and you head north. Well, guess what? You ain't making it to PCB. You're just not. Why? Because it is your direction, not your intention, that determines your destination. It is your direction that ultimately dictates where you end up. Now, when we talk about traveling, when we talk about road trips, we talk about vacation, we get this. This is very simple. We don't argue, we don't dispute this. But where there becomes a disconnect in our world, and I have lived this, likely you have lived this, where the disconnect comes from is oftentimes, oftentimes we don't apply this principle to other aspects of our life, to other pathways of our life. Because relationally speaking, we are on a number of paths. Whether it's with a significant other, whether it's with your children, whether it's with your friends, you are always on a path in that relationship. And it is the direction that determines the destination of that relationship, not the intentions that you have. Those of you that are in school, your schooling experience, your college experience, this principle applies. When it comes to your professional career, it is your direction, not your intention, that will determine your destination. When it comes to your finances, again, there are numerous paths across your life that this principle will apply. The problem is, is that the disconnect comes is that we don't often apply this principle to these other aspects of our life. We, often, uh, we don't often associate that the direction that we're heading compared to the hopes and the dreams and the goals that we have. Oftentimes, we're just fly by the seat of our pants, whatever feels right, whatever feels good, whatever feels as long as my heart's in it and it's good, well then, everything's gonna be all right. But the truth of the matter is that this principle applies, that it is your direction, not your intention, not your hopes and dreams, not even your beliefs that will determine your destination, that will determine where you end up. And as I said, this path, excuse me, this principle of the path, it isn't secular, it's documented. We're gonna look at a story in scripture. We're gonna be in Proverbs chapter seven, whether you've got a Bible, a digital Bible, or it's gonna be up here on the screen. But we're gonna kind of walk through this and you will see where this principle of the path becomes applied and becomes a part of our day-to-day -day life. Now, the, the, the book of Proverbs, most if not all of that is attributed to Solomon. There's a little bit of grace in there that, that as the, the collection of wisdom from generation over generation was compiled and collected, Solomon being known as the wisest person to ever live is attributed to writing most if not all of that. And, and there's a little bit of leeway in here in this story that we're looking at to know, did this actually happen to Solomon or is Solomon just taking this as an illustration to, to apply and to show this principle and demonstrate it. I don't know for sure. You can kind of be the judge for yourself as we walk through this story, but what that's not important. Don't get bogged down in, in this or that. Get bogged down in what is Solomon trying to teach us? 
What is God's word trying to say and speak to you today? Because that's the goal. That's the intent as we're looking at God's word that's been preserved for years and generations and millennium to this point today. Here we are, 2023, that words of ancient text can be a part of our life. That's what we're going to be doing today. And just to give you a kind of a backdrop to this story, the story takes place as kind of a, an older, wiser figure who has like a 30,000 foot view of the world around him. And what he sees is he sees an individual that's going down a predictable path that's going down a path that this older, wiser figure knows the destination, knows where it ends up. But the person in the story, the person on the path, they don't recognize it. They don't see it. And you have likely experienced this before. If you're like me, you've been on the path. I would think that most of us, if not all of us at some point, have been the one on the path that walks a journey that they shouldn't. But if you've ever taken the time to look at a generation behind you, or if you have children, or if you've served in kids, then you know that if you've walked a life stage before, it's very easy to look and go, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't walk that path. I wouldn't step in that. I wouldn't keep going because the principle of the path is true, that it is your direction that determines your destination. So here we go. Proverbs chapter seven, starting in verse six. It says, at the window of my house, look down through the lattice, and I saw among the simple... I noticed among the young men a youth who had no sense. Now, there's a tension right here, right off the bat, that if you would classify yourself as a young person for you to get offended and go, how dare Solomon say this about me? And let me tell you, you you have two choices right now, okay? You can get offended by this. That that you you can just take this for what it is and say, I can't believe that Solomon would have this viewpoint of me. Or you can choose to learn from it, okay? And I would just, I would implore you, learn from this. Learn from this, learn from this. Wisdom is a good thing for you. And so this is not a personal indictment. This is not an attack on your character. This is not what Solomon's intention is in bringing this up. What he's doing is he is just highlighting there is a difference that the longer that you live in life, the better at life you're probably going to get. Now, some of you learned that a hard way again, but in that, did you know that when it comes to having, excuse me, there's another uh, another verse in this, another translation that says, one who lacks judgment. Do you know what it takes to have good judgment? Somebody tell me, what does it take to have good judgment? Experience and and wisdom. Here's what what I've got, okay? That good judgment is time and experience, time and experience, time and experience. It will ultimately lead to good judgment, at least more often than not. But did you know that there are two things that young people don't have? Do you know what that is? It's time and experience. It's time and experience. And so again, you can get upset, you can get offended, or you can realize, you know what? Solomon's right. Solomon is right that I don't know everything. And if you wanna talk about an uncomfortable place to be, but a great place for you to be, it is comfortable in a posture of humility that says, I don't know everything. Because if you get comfortable saying to yourself, I don't know everything, then it it will become more comfortable, become more natural for you to seek wisdom outside of your own head, okay? And let me tell you, young people, We need that. We need that. We need that. And all the parents said, there you go. (laughs) You are welcome. You are welcome. There you go. Um, Anyway, continuing on, continuing on in the story. This is what Solomon says. He says that he was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house at twilight as the day was fading and the dark of night set in. Now, at this point, you don't have to be a Bible scholar, nor do you really have to have been around the block to know, hmm, there is a direction that this story is starting to go. There is a path that this is beginning to follow that I don't need a whole lot of wisdom. I don't need a whole lot of Bible knowledge to realize I don't think that this is going in the right direction. I don't think that this is going in the way that I think it should go. Now, in that, there's a generational divide that takes place in this story. Because if you could kind of turn up the volume on a soundtrack, right? There is a a young soundtrack that's got your favorite Friday night playlist that's happening right here, okay? Okay going down the street, getting near the corner, direction of her house, it's twilight, you know, it's just like, all right, all right, let's turn that volume up a little bit. But the other side, the wisdom side, it also has a soundtrack. And if you turn that music up, it is something out of a horror movie that there is danger lurking around the corner, okay? Two completely different mindsets, two completely different soundtracks. And the story Continues. It is right out of a spring break story if I've ever seen one. Here we go. It says, and then 
Out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. (laughs) Sorry if you have children. She is unruly and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares. At every corner, she lurks. And she took hold of him and kissed him. And with a brazen face, she said, Today, I fulfilled my vows and I have food from my fellowship offerings at home. And that probably does take a little bit of Bible study and insight. But what it says is in this moment, I have made my peace with God and I am ready to go. Okay, that is what's happening in this moment. And so, so I came out to meet you. I looked for you and I found you. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. A lot of detail there, a lot that we are not going to unpack. But in that, as you are walking along the path, or as Solomon points out, the young that walks along this path has a viewpoint in mind that goes, this is awesome. This is everything I dreamed of. I only read about this. I didn't know this was an actual path that you could take. But there's another side to the story. There's another side that wisdom would tell you. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't keep going that direction. I wouldn't keep following down this path because where the young, where the naive, where the simple thinks this is just an isolated event. It's a one-time thing. It's Friday night. It's spring break. It's just a weekend. It's just one time. Where the young thinks, this is an isolated event. The wise know, no, 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 no. This is not just an isolated event. This is a path. This is a path that has a destination. And this, this is where the story takes a turn. That if you're the older, wiser figure in this story, it takes the turn that you know it would take. But if you are young and naive and inexperienced, then it takes the turn that you do not expect because Solomon continues in verse 21 and says this, that with persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk and all at once, he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter. You think, wait, no, 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 no. That's, that's not what I was following. I mean, if that's, if that's how you slaughter an ox, throw some horns on here and take me to pasture, let's go, right? No, Solomon says, this doesn't end the way that you think it does. This doesn't end the way that you had hoped it would. The way this story ends is, well, it takes you farther than you thought you were willing to go. The way that this story goes, it doesn't end in rainbows and butterflies. It ends like an ox to the slaughter. If that weren't enough, Solomon continues. He gives us another example. He says, it's like a deer stepping into a noose until an arrow pierces its liver. It's like a deer finding a a cozy place to nestle. And then all of a sudden you feel this pull that you try to pull away from and it gets tighter and you pull away from and it gets tighter and you pull away from and it's tighter. When from the peripheries, A hunter draws a bow until an arrow pierces and it bleeds out. If that wasn't graphic enough, Solomon continues. He says, it's like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing, little knowing it will cost him his life. Solomon, that's not the way that I saw this path going. That's not the way that I thought this story was going to go. That's not the way this was supposed to be. And at this point, Solomon, he kind of breaks the fourth wall in his own story. He says, now then, my sons, listen to me. Listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. And anytime dad says, hey, you need to listen, he says it twice, you better be listening. Now then, listen. Don't let your heart turn to her ways. Or stray into her past. Don't let your heart, don't let the emotional guide for your life get pulled and tangled into this mess. Don't let your heart 
turn to her ways or stray into her paths, for many are the victims she has brought down. I think, no, I'm different. Uh, No, 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 I I know me. I know my limits. I I know what I can do. I know when to pull back. I I know me, right? You don't know me. I know me. And Solomon go, I do know you. And I know that there have been many who are just like you, who have fallen prey. Many are the victims that she's brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. You've heard the ACDC song before, but this is the way that Solomon puts it in verse 27. He says that her house is a highway to the grave leading down to the chambers of death. Mm. Do you get it now? Solomon says, look, you can have the best laid intentions of your life. And you can follow after, you can chase after whatever feels right, whatever looks right, whatever feels good, whatever looks good. And you can follow after that if you would like. But you will find this. The end result, the destination, the place where you will ultimately end up because of this path. It is a place that you would not choose. It is a place that will cost you. Now, let me move to to kind of the the practical side here. Because when we first began reading this story, you you had an idea of where this was going. And and chances are you had an idea of where this was going, not because of, uh, of necessarily where you are right now, but either because of your past experiences or because you've seen it in somebody else. You've seen it in somebody else's path. Isn't it so much easier to to spot the pitfalls in someone else's journey than it is in your own? Isn't it so much easier to look at your brother and go, man, I wouldn't have done that. Man, I've done that before. that's That's not a great plan. Isn't it easier to see the potential dangers in someone else's story than it is in your own? I know I'm not alone in that. There is something about being on our own path. There's kind of a, there's a disconnect. There's a haze. There's a fog to be able to see where the destination actually leads. Because in the present moment, you're not fueled by your future. Oftentimes in the present moment, you're fueled by your present desire, by your current appetites. That's what fuels you in the present moment. And there's another, I think, disconnect that comes that that tells us, well, as long as my heart is pure, as long as my intentions are good, as long as as my my hopes and dreams are are aligned with God, well, then it doesn't matter what I do. Any path will get me there. And if I could, can I just tell you that is a lie. That is a lie that either somebody's trying to sell you on or it is a lie that you are trying to make yourself feel better. It's a little more therapeutic to think, well, my heart's in it. My heart's good. God, God, you know, you know me. But the principle of the path tells us that it's our direction, not our intention, not our best made plans, not our God-sized vision for our future. It is our direction that determines where we end up. Let me give you some examples. As many of us have the intention or had the intention to say, you know what, I, I want to end up with a great Christian partner. That, that if marriage is going to be a part of my story, well, you know what, I, I want a great Christian partner, somebody that has their act together. Is that too much to ask for, right? But yet, far too often in our world, the direction is, well, I'll, I'll go out with anybody and everybody that asks. I mean, yeah, yeah, I have standards, but I, maybe I'll never meet the guy if I don't ever say yes. Maybe I'll never meet the girl if I don't ever say yes. And so our direction, what well, trumps our intention. How about this one? You ever been here before? I, I want our family to be a unit. And when I say a, a unit, I mean, I, I, want, I want a great relationship with my spouse. I want my kids to know that they can come to me no matter what. I want my kids to know that I have their back in everything that I do. And I want our family to be a unit. And the time that we get together, I, I want it to be fun. I want it to be life-giving. I want it to be so much fun that even when they're not kids anymore, they can't help but want to be with us because that's the relationship that we have, right? It's a beautiful intention. That is a God-sized vision for family and for the future of your family. But far too many of us, our direction is, well, I'm going to work constantly and I'm not going to carve out intentional time with my spouse or my kids. God-sized intention. But your path 
Well, it trumps your intention. How about this one? I want to grow old, and I want to be able to invest in my grandchildren. I want to be that matriarch or that patriarch of the family. I want to be that figurehead. (laughs) And far too often our direction goes, hey, we supersize it for me. (laughs) We don't invest in our current self. Because investing in our current self is really investing in our future self. I, you know what? I think I, I'll skip the fruit cup today. I'll do the fries. You know, large fries, please. Yeah, I think I want two sandwiches. I'm really hungry. Well, mm. how about this one? I want to know God. I, I want to know God on, on a deep, intimate level. I want every moment of my life to feel as if I'm walking hand in hand with God. That, that everything I experience is as if we experience it together because that's how connected, that's how rooted I am in my relationship with God. But your direction tells you probably about an hour ago, you got your screen time report that says you spend an average of eight hours a day on your smartphone this week. You see, your path has trumped your intentions. It has steamrolled the God-sized vision that you may have for your life. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up for a second, Okay because it probably feels like you're getting beat up a little bit. And that was not my intention to which you would say, well, that hasn't been your direction for the last 20 minutes. And, the, <laughs> and, and I agree, I agree, okay? And, and let me tell you, there's nothing that I'm saying here that I'm not saying to me. Because I've, I've been the fool, I've been the one on the path. There's probably ways right now that I'm on the path that I don't even realize it. I got people looking from a 30,000 foot view going, I wouldn't do that, okay? I, I'm here, <laughs> I'm with you. And, and in this, what we have to understand and what we have to realize is that, that, that a principle can be leveraged either for you or against you. And this is a principle that we can begin to leverage for our gain and for our benefit, not just for ourselves. But in, in this, the, the way that I want to I close our time today is I want to I speak to, to both of these main characters that get brought up in Solomon's story, both the wise figure and the person on the path. And here's what I find kind of just, just kind of baffling, but, but realizing you can be the wise figure and the one on the path at the same time. And it's like a, a kind of a, a crazy, crazy kind of example here, but, but you can be both. You can choose to be both. And in this, I, I want to speak First, to the young, to the, to the naive, to the, to the one who lacks judgment only because you lack the experience and the wisdom that comes with just doing life. To you, I hope you hear that because you are young, that because you lack experience and that you lack the type of judgment that those who are a little bit further ahead may have over you, that does not take away the position that you have in the kingdom of God. It does not, it's not an attack on you, on your character. It does not diminish the place that you have because you have passions that deserve to be pursued because you have a heart that sees this world differently than generations that have been ahead of you see the world. And so in that, this is not, this is not, this is not to squelch any of that passion that you have, but it's to help us realize You have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to continue to learn. And you may think, well, I'm in my 30s. I know everything. (laughs) There you go. The the, the 40s and the 50s and the 60-year-olds laugh at you and laugh at me because far too often we don't check and, and inventory ourselves to look and go, is the path that I'm on leading me to the destination that I want to be? And more so, what we don't do is we don't inventory not just ourselves, but the people around us. Because there is another principle that rings true that we don't really have time to unpack, but I don't think it needs much. And it is this, is that your friends determine the quality and the direction of your life, right? You've probably heard it said, show me your friends and I'll show you what? Your future. And it becomes easy to see the potential dangers and the potential pitfalls and the potential destinations that some of your friends will land at. And the question becomes, when was the last time that you took an inventory on those that you hold dear and those that you keep close to you? And answer the question, 
Are these people, are my actions, is my path, is this leading me to the place that I ultimately want to be? And you want to talk tough conversation. It is a difficult conversation to have with a friend that says, hey, we need to be moving a different direction. This is the way that I want to go in life, and I want you with me because I love you. But if we can't get there, and there needs to be some distance and some separation between someone that you love and you hold dear, difficult conversation. But Solomon tells us, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, because the destination might cost you something. It might cost you the very relationships that you hold dear. It might cost you the very career-minded goals that you are driven towards. It may cost you all of the things that you love. It may even cost you your life. So take an inventory of your current path. Overlay that with the God-sized dreams and visions that you have for your life and see where you are. And then I would add this. Look around at who's modeling that now. Who is a stage ahead of you or two stages ahead of you that you go, man, I don't know how they got there, but if I were to have this picture, that this vision, if I could put my finger on it, they model it well and I would get annoying about being around that person as much as I could. Get annoying about trying to be in the presence of somebody who has lived it and done it before. Now let me turn the page to the wise, to the person with the 30,000 foot view looking from the window. There's a good chance that you've been in agreement with just about everything that we've said today, either for one of two reasons, either because you've lived it and you've walked the hard path and now you're like, you know what, I got enough life experience and enough wisdom to know what I should do and to know what I shouldn't do. And many of you, you are sitting in your comfortable window seat because you had somebody else help you along the journey as well. Chances are you didn't get to that window seat on your own. And so here's what I would challenge you with as well. I don't think world changers watch from the window. I don't think they do. World changers don't sit from a 30,000 foot view and look down and go, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't do that. I mean, have you been on TikTok lately? Do you see what these kids are doing? I can't believe it. That's fine. That that is a, a viewpoint that you can have in life. But if Tom, if what Tom said a few weeks ago is true, the chances are the next big idea, the next revolutionary idea, the next thing that's going to change the course of human history is likely going to come from a generation behind you. Then here's what I want to know: What are you doing to help protect? and to help lead and to help guide that generation along. Because can I tell you something? They need you. They need your wisdom. They need your experience. We need your wisdom. I need your wisdom. And world changers, they don't watch from the window. World changers, they get on the path and they help direct, they help guide, and they help share stories And they help say, let me tell you about the time that I got it wrong to save you from getting it wrong like I did. You heard us mention starting point earlier, and and it's aptly named starting point for a reason because it is kind of that on-ramp to to community. It's that on-ramp to serving. It's that on-ramp to to really being a full-fledged and fully devoted member of Northfield. But there's a reason that we call it starting point and not finish line. Because if all you ever did was attend a class about why we do what we do and how we do what we do, well, at that point, you've really only committed to a place. And that's okay. But committing yourself to a place and committing yourself to a person, committing yourself to a people group, committing yourself and being open and being vulnerable about you and your experience and helping lead and guide somebody along, well, we're night and day difference here. Because when you commit yourself to a people group, what you do is you get the opportunity to to experience this beautiful Christian community that God 
offers us. Because on the journey of life, we need each other. We weren't meant to do it alone. We weren't meant to walk alone and therefore we need each other. And if you haven't attended Starting Point, if you haven't heard a little bit about why we do what we do, let's get in the game. Let's get on the path. Let's lead the next generation forward. And let's change the world with God together. So to the young, understand you don't know everything and you aren't expected to know everything and your passions deserve to be pursued and we want to do it with you. But don't think that you're the exception. Don't think that with you, things will be different. Many have gone down the path of inexperience before and many it's led to their destruction. And to the wise, remember, you were once that young, naive who lacked judgment. You were. And in that, do them a favor. Pay it forward the same way that somebody graciously looked back at you and helped you along the journey. Remember, it is your direction, not your intention. It is your direction that will determine your destination, which brings us to another question. Well, how do I know which path is right? And to that, I would say, then you need to be on a path that brings you back here next week. Yeah. Father, <laughs> Father, thank you for today. Thank you for words that have been preserved for generation after generation that here they are, they still ring true today. God, if, if there is somebody in the room that, that's right on the cusp of saying, I, I'm done with this path that I'm on, God, would you put somebody in their path that'll walk alongside them and help pull them in the direction that you would have for them. Father, I'm thankful just for the beautiful vision of your church, for what it means to gather together, to worship together, but to do life and to change this world in the name of Jesus together. Would you allow that to be the vision of our hearts and our minds and of our church? Father, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Hey, I'm thankful that you're here. I hope you have a great spring break week. If you're a guest with us, you've never made yourself known, we would love to meet you. Come hang out over there at the green room, meet some of our staff. There's some giving boxes on the way out. Y'all have a great spring break. Peace. Peace.